Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Let us pray. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. May we persevere in your word, in the communion that you have given us, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers, until the day when we enter into the new life that you have prepared for us, life eternal. Amen. Saints of God, holy and dearly loved, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts, 40, Acts 2, 42 to 47 is a section that talks about what we have in common, what Christ gives to his entire church. Now, there are some people who read these verses and think that Luke gives a mandate to his church for all times as to how we are to act. Some Christians go as far as promoting communism because of these verses, but they would be wrong in doing so. Luke doesn't give us a how-to manual. Rather, he's describing the, man, the manner of life among the first Christians in Jerusalem. And that is an example for us of Christian love. And so, as Christians, let's think about first and foremost what we have in common. We are participants in Christ, including in his resurrection of the dead, because Christ is risen. There is one body and one spirit, in the same way that you've been called to one hope by your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We have a part in God's heavenly calling. Our life together comes from the fact that Jesus has died for all, so that we might not live for ourselves, but for him who has died and who has risen for us. And everything that we have, it is all a gift. The very first converts persevered. They continued in what they had received from the Lord, in the apostles' teaching, in the communion, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. And as for us, we do that exact same thing. We devote ourselves to what God has given us because they are gifts from God. We have the Word of God, which is the written record of the Apostles' teaching. We listen to sermons that are based on that Word. We meditate and read devotions that reveal that Word to us. We sing hymns that express that Word. And we rejoice in all of the teachings of God, in his law, in his commandments, in his precepts, in the teachings about his mercy, his kindness, his love, and his grace towards us. The teaching of the word unites us in a common faith. And so we gather for our communion in the same way that it manifests what Christ gives us together through the breaking of bread. And so we gather together. We gather together to pray to the Lord for ourselves, for his church, and for this world. And as the church, we give what Christ has given to us freely to others. There is no charge to being a member of a parish. Jesus said to his disciples, you have received freely, freely give. And so the church echoes this welcoming word of God. All you who are thirsty, come to the water. Even the person who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without paying anything. Jesus offers free salvation 
that costs nothing to those who will receive it, but that he paid for at the price of his very own life. And so it is that our parishes don't require money to become or to remain a member. Everyone is welcome. From the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, the church freely gives to whoever will receive the gifts of Christ. And we are to do this without favoritism. We all have a part in the gifts of Christ. We are all enriched by the participation of every member of the church in whatever way he can contribute to the life that we have together. That can be by our presence, by our gifts, our competences, our our skills that we have, by our prayers, and by our offerings. For the Christians in Jerusalem, they recognized that they had received everything from the Lord, and that motivated them to be generous, because God had been generous towards them. And so we read verses 44 and 45, and these verses say that those who believed held everything in common. They sold their property and their their goods and shared the proceeds among all according to their needs. Now, I've already said in this sermon that this is not a universal obligation. (laughs) Rather, it's a description of the life together that happened in Jerusalem, and it's an example of Christian love. The fact that certain people in the parish benefited from the generosity of others tells us that not all the parishioners were able to contribute. And yet the the church took care of everyone. And, And we also must note that the apostles didn't force anyone to sell their goods to maintain other people. No, the people who did that did it sacrificially. They did it voluntarily for the well-being. Jesus didn't come to be a new Moses, to establish a new law. Rather, Jesus reinforces the law that has always existed, that of love. And so our common bond of love in Christ produces a love towards our neighbors that motivates us also to contribute to the well-being of all according to our own means. Paul writes to the Corinthians, may, sh- may each one of you give as he has decided in his own heart, without regret or without um, complaint or, or, or uh, being forced to do it. God loves a cheerful giver. And again, in his letter to Philemon, Paul writes, I didn't want to do anything without your permission so that your gift would not be seen as forced, but as freely given. And so frankly, in these times, these difficult times, if some people can't give what they gave before, it doesn't make them less faithful Christians. And it doesn't mean that they are not loved by God. So if you find yourself in this position, do not be ashamed that you don't have money. I promise you, I I will assure you that we would much rather have you in church, in a church that is full, in which only a few people are able to give, than it would be to have a, a church building that is pretty much empty, where only a few people take up the task of paying the bills. There are, though, people who could be more generous and who have to be encouraged to give, looking at what God has first given them. And that this would not be done um, out of obligation. So I ask you, have you taken the time to think about what you can do personally for the spreading of the gospel. And if you can't do anything else, even if you have to do less, that's not a problem. But if you can contribute and you haven't done it, I encourage you to do it. For the time being, we are not allowed to get together. 
But just the same, we have to take care of our parishes where God has adopted us as his own dear beloved children in the waters of baptism. That, where, that place where he forgives us our sins, where he teaches us his word, where we have received and will once again receive the Lord's Supper. The Lord has said that those who preach the gospel are to live by the gospel. And that the one who is taught should share all good things with the one who has taught him. And so I have to ask you, have you done that? Have you given part of what the Lord has blessed you with to those who teach you that word? Christian love pushes us not only to maintain our buildings, though, but also to take care of one another in Christian love. And so I would also say, if you see a need of a fellow Christian, take care of them. It is Christian love and not an obligation that forces us to act in kindness and to be generous to others. When the church in Jerusalem was persecuted and suffering, Paul encouraged an offering to help those in Jerusalem. And he said that the Corinthians should put money aside every week, each according to what he was able, each according to what he had, until Paul was able to come and gather the gifts. And so I would encourage you either to send an offering to your parish or wait until you can do that but put money aside as you're able until you can once again gather in your church. Your generosity also can serve as an example to others. Paul cites the Corinthians to other churches to encourage others in their giving. He, write them, he, he writes to the Corinthians afterwards that your zeal has encouraged most of them also and so we must admit that in this moment, it is easy, it is easy to wonder if the Lord will provide for our needs. And I can't promise you that everything will be perfect and easy, but God can, by all of his grace, provide all that you need to satisfy all of your needs, and that he will give you what you need in abundance to allow you to do the good works that he has called you to do. For it is written, he has given his gifts. He has given to the poor, and his righteousness endures forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Have no fear, little flock. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So, dear saints, let us think about what we have in common. Let us be thankful for what the Lord gives us and what he continues to give us, what he's given in the past and what he gives us today. And let us persevere. Let us run towards the goal of the heavenly prize in Christ Jesus. Let us persevere in the teaching that the apostles have given us, in the communion in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. Let us persevere in Christian love. Every day, with perseverance, receive the gifts God has for you with joy. And praise the Lord. Jesus is still coming to us today with his gifts, with his word, with his forgiveness, with his life. He gives it to you all. He gives it to you freely. And he gives you a place in his kingdom that has no end. And he can give it because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.